Thanks for having me and um, thanks for still being here and still being awake after these uh, almost two very inspiring uh, days. And uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the toolkit that we've developed in a previous project uh, in which Raquel was actually also involved. Um, to, and this was a project uh, that was uh, called the Newsreader Project and this was really for current news. Uh, so we were targeting the financial economic domain and um, what we're doing now is uh, I'm involved in Claria. You've also heard it called Claria and Claria and people are not sure how to pronounce it exactly. Um, but that is sort of the follow-up of Claren and L. You could sort of see it as that. So uh, there what we're trying to do is, you know, build infrastructure for uh, doing these sort of things for the humanities. And, you know, then we start to get into historical newspapers and those sort of things. So we're actually working on taking these tools that we've previously developed and adapting them to this domain. So this is all very much work in progress. And I'd like to present the tools that we have now to you. And I'd be interesting to hear from you, well, you know, what would it take for you to use these and what could we do to make sure that we can also apply them to these historical uh, newspapers and, and the data sources that are interesting to you. Um, so the Newsreader project ran uh, from January 2013 to December 2015, with, of course, some extra, you know, fixing up the documentation and those sort of things. Um, we had uh, an international consortium, so Free University was a coordinator. Uh, we had the University of the Basque Country, um, who were covering Spanish language tools for us, Fondation Bruno Kessler, uh, doing Italian natural language processing, but also semantic web uh, technology. Uh, LexisNexis was our content provider, so we just got like loads and loads of newspapers from them um, in nicely digital born XML. So that was, a, you know, uh, OCR, I think, is a problem we didn't have to deal with. Um, we had a company, Scraper Wiki, in the UK. Um, to provide us with extra websites that they scraped, um, but they also helped us uh, organize hackathons, do outreach to different user groups, uh, such as BBC, Financial Times, The Guardian. Uh, we talked to World Bank now through them. Um, and Cinescope, uh, which is a spin-off of Eindhoven University of the Visualization uh, Department there, um, <coughs> building a really cool visualization on top of it, um, the visualization right now is not really available to, to people. I mean, you need like a pretty hefty <laughs> license there. So, so that is one of the things we're trying to work out. And basically the goal is to read massive streams of, of news from different sources and record the changes in the world in, in four languages. Um, and actually what we did, we set up a pipeline and uh, um, Pecha actually came to visit us and they set up uh, the pipeline using the same setup and the same format in Bulgarian. So it's, it's easily extendable to other languages. Uh, we try to make it as modular as possible. And uh, we basically tried to make these little event uh, descriptions of what happened, where, when, and who was involved. And um, I know that, you know, what, what is an event is, is quite an issue in, in linguistics, but also in the humanities domain, basically, the definition that we took is that it's something that happens and it has a place and time. And, and we're very agnostic about exactly what that should be and what, what you know, are we big, big events, small events. Um, and practically in our tools, um, we go fairly low level where lots of verbs or actions and these, those are tagged as events. And in later, later steps, we actually abstract away from those nitty gritty ones and try to merge things into bigger events. Um, so basically, we try to go from text to RDF, um, and that's where computational linguistics and semantic web uh, researchers really work together, and, and we think that's, that's really valuable. I'm mostly going to be talking about the linguistic processing today, um, because I think that's, that's more interesting to you, but I'd be happy to, to talk offline more about the semantic web stuff. Um, and we also uh, look into who made a statement what do they say? How do they feel about it? Do they agree? Do they disagree? And uh, so basically the provenance of a statement. <coughs> um, I'm not sure if you can read this, but basically what we're doing, I'm just going to move this a little bit, is we've got a bunch of text. And uh, the slides are actually online, so if you can read. But these are two newspaper articles 
The first one says the Porsche family buys back 10% stake from Qatar and Qatar holding uh, sells 10% stake in Porsche to founding families. Basically, these two newspaper articles talk about the same thing. They just use different words. So our goal is to analyze these news articles individually through our pipeline, which I'm going to be talking about most. Then we get, from the natural language processing, we get, per document, we get an XML representation of the words and what was said in that newspaper article. And uh, then we make a step, we abstract away from those to uh, an RDF representation. And what we try to do there is merge events. So the buying and the selling events in these two articles, act there's only one 10% uh, stake selling going on here, um, but, you know, because they were actually on the same published around the same date, they had the same actors involved, so we think, hey, this is probably the same thing, just told from a different perspective. And we merged that into one representation, which we then put on our database. And um, you can search that database, so you just get an event database rather than mentions, but you can still go back to every newspaper article to inspect the sources of what it was, because you probably can't see it, but here we say this Daily Telegraph article, characters, zero to seven, they stated this. Um, the natural language processing pipeline. This is the pipeline for English that we have. We have similar pipelines for Dutch, Spanish, and Italian. I think actually our Basque colleagues also made one for Basque. Um, and there's a lot of modules in here. And basically what these um, arrows indicate is that certain modules are dependent on other modules. So we start with a document and we do topic classification. So what is this document about? Is it about finance? Is it about health? Is it about whatnot? So that's fairly shallow, fairly general. And um, then we basically employ the whole NLP stack. So we go from tokenizing. So where does a sentence start? Where does it end? Where does a word start? Where does it end? We do part of speech tagging. Is this a noun? Is this a verb? Um, then we you know, also do the syntactic analysis. What is the subject of this uh, sentence? What's the object, etc. We do opinions. We do co-reference of events. So within the same document, if the same event is mentioned several times, we try to you know, say, well, this is actually talking about the same event. We recognize names in text. Uh, person names, location names, organization names, product names. And we also do co-reference within the document. So Barack Obama, Mr. Obama, Obama, these are all the same thing. And um, also the question that came to Raquel, we also try to link those to external sources. And I'm going to be talking about those more in a bit. So find the, the suitable Wikipedia page that talks about, that describes this person or this organization. Um, temporal expressions, temporal relations, causal relation extraction, semantic roles. Um, I'm actually going to be digging into these things. Um, a little bit about how we set up the pipeline. Uh, we've got the NLP annotation format, or NAF, as we call it. Uh, it's standoff XML. And, okay, this is yet another format. Um, it's partly based on things we did previously in other projects, such as CAF, which is the Kyoto annotation format developed in a previous um, thing. TAF, which I think is a Dutch format. LAF, which I think is a Norwegian format. And we borrow some ideas from RDF, such as uh, using URIs. So uh, using unique ident resource identifiers to encode our, thing, our um, statements. Um, Menzo yesterday already mentioned uh, Folia, which is another format that is used a lot in the Netherlands. Um, and we're currently working with the researchers from Folia in the context of Claria to make sure that we can convert at least between these two um, um, these two formats. And the reason why we went for, for this format, so I don't know how, how much you've played around with these natural language processing tools, but um, some of you may have used named entity recognition. You, for example, have the Stanford named entity recognizer, which is one of the most commonly used. It's got its own XML uh, format. Uh, it can also do some sort of uh, 
tab separated things. Then you may have used Gate, which is developed in Sheffield. They have their own format. So, um, and, and every group has something. And because we needed to build this huge pipeline for the project, we, um, some of the modules we developed ourselves, some of the modules we, we had already from other projects and we just you know, updated them, adapted them to this domain. Um, and some modules we, you know, we got open source modules such as the named entity recognizer, which we actually swapped out for a better one um, in one of the versions of the pipeline. Um, to, um, for example, uh, recognize, you know, this is Barack Obama, hey, this is his Wikipedia page. There's a tool called DBpedia Spotlight. Um, they output JSON. Uh, we had to normalize all that. So basically what we did is we had this NAF format. Um, and our own modules, you know, they were just native NAF. Um, but then other modules, like the, for Dutch, the Alpino parser, or for uh, English, the other parsers, we built a wrapper around it. So every module here takes NAF as input and outputs NAF. And then you can easily take out a module and put in a different parser or put in a different named entity recognizer as long as you use that format. And um, it's not a perfect solution, but this was very workable for us. And it also um, makes it easy for people to take this pipeline. And if you're a bit handy with these things, you can just plug in your own module as long as you use that format. Um, and, and what we do is every annotation just it, it creates a new layer. So I recently did a batch of tweets and a tweet is very short and it ends up an XML file with the full NLP stack um, of all these processing steps ends up to be about 2200 lines. Um, but there's a lot of information in there. Um, this is for a, a little example from the header. So uh, we also think that, that um, you know, keeping track of our processing steps and uh, what happened to this document is very important in order to be able to reproduce it. I mean, there's always going to be an element of, you know, some of these things are machine learning, so there's an element of, of you know, uh, probability in there. You're not going to be able to have a perfect reproducibility. But um, basically what we say, for example, well, there's a linguistic processor. Uh, it operates on the text layer. Uh, when it was processed, uh, when it started, when it ended, um, what machine we used, what uh, module this was, this was the tokenizer that identifies where does a word stop, where does it end, um, and we also have the version information in here. Um, and we do this for every step that is taken in the pipeline. So this is ugly, but you know it records a lot. Um, and then what, we, what you get, for example, for a word, you, you get the word here. Um, you get what paragraph it was, what sentence it was. Uh, we get the length, we have an ID, and we get an offset. So where does the word start and end? Where does the word start? Um, <coughs> sorry? Where it starts in the line. Where it starts in the document. So you count the characters from, from the start. Um, and then we have actually written down that we start counting at zero and we don't count spaces because actually different formats use different things, which is a bloody pain in the... Um, sorry. Um, I think probably for you, I mean, I, could exp I don't have time to explain the entire pipeline, but I think probably the semantic annotation is for this audience the most interesting. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so first of all, named entry recognition and linking. Then also going a little bit from word to concepts, and I, I think there's going to be quite some discussion there, because uh, I think there's a lot more we can do there, but that's a first start to abstract away from how it is said in the text, but what does it mean? Um, a bit of semantic role labeling, and then recognizing temporal expressions relations and a bit of wikification. Um, <coughs> named entity recognition. So, you know, we all want to know who's mentioned in this text and what companies are mentioned in this text. And then our colleagues in, in Basque Country, they uh, built um, a named entry recognizer uh, that outperforms a lot of the state of the art. So this is one of the, um, one of the results on a standard data set. This is very important. So we get a 91 
uh, point F score on the Connell 2003 test results. And the Connell 2003 data set is, consists of Reuters news articles from the 90s, I believe. And it's got a lot of sports in there. It's got a lot of cricket in there. So actually when you go, and th they just took two days or something that they annotated. And a lot of these systems, they are trained on the same newspaper and then they test on this as well. So they perform quite well. If you go to a different data set, your performance is going to drop. Um, we try to mitigate this a little bit um, because what they do in, in this named entity recognizer that we have is um, uh, a, lot of a lot of data was added, so clusters. So um, for example, we added the Wikipedia corpus and then you know we also had um, maybe uh, beach volleyball, which is not in the writer's corpus, but because there are Wikipedia pages about beach volleyball, it recognizes the kinds of words that talk about beach volleyball, and hopefully it does a little bit better then. So we use you know, brown clustering and those sort of things. It's all in, in the paper. Um, and then we also use, for named entity linking, the DBPDF spotlight um, thing. And, and for those of you who's, familiar, who's not familiar with DBPedia, okay. That's, that's very few, that's, that's great. So um, DBpedia is the database version of Wikipedia. So in Wikipedia, you've got um, these, uh, for example, you've got info boxes and you have tables and you have other sorts of structured information. Then a bunch of researchers from, I think originally Leipzig took that and automatically harvested all those and they created a database out of the structured information in Wikipedia. And that's very useful to use here. Um, this tool is not, great, but it allows you to do certain things. So what we did, for example, this is um, how the named entities are represented in our, uh, in our, in our format. And you see online uh, 12,717. Uh, so first we, we actually recognize that there's a Honda Jazz, which is uh, terms 22 and 23 in our text. And it finds a link to the Honda Jazz web page in DBpedia, or you could say Wikipedia. Um, and we also found Belastingdienst, so the IRS, the Dutch tax uh, services, um, and it finds the page about the Belastingdienst. So why do I want to do this? Well, it allows you to do more fine-grained querying. So most entity recognizers only recognize three or four types of entities or maybe seven. Those are sort of the standard things. Uh, personal location organization, maybe miscellaneous and maybe they've got a few subdivisions there. Um, but DBpedia has 600 and something classes. It has politicians, it has actors, it has a class for adult actors, um, it has newspapers, it has uh, football players, it's got uh, different car companies. So um, you can actually ask if you've done this, you can say, well, give me all the politicians that you have in your data set, or give me all the football players. Um, plus, you can use the information that's in there, such as birth dates of people, to say, well, give me all the politicians born after 1900, or all the companies, the, the, the software companies located in the UK that are released in that database, because that is one limitation. It has to be in that database. And that database is not perfect, but it, it, is, it is there and it's usable. And um, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is to grow this, but also use you know, maybe for, for humanities use cases, this is not the right data set. But there might be other databases that contain interesting knowledge about your domain that we could use in here. So that's, I think, one question for us. It's like, hey, what is out there? What could we use um, to plug into this module to make it more usable to humanities researchers? Um, but you can already do something. So this is a little... Um, project we did with a research master student and a professor from literature studies in our department and uh, he took the discovery of heaven and put it into that module 
and uh, created, well, you can go to the website. Um, and uh, we, in that book, we try to find different concepts that were mentioned or somehow um, related to things <coughs> or persons that were related to particular concepts in the book. And I don't know if you're familiar with the book, but it's, it's a very big book, 800 something pages. And it discusses uh, the arts, but it also discusses sciences and those things. So the uh, literary scientists were interesting, like, well, can we automatically detect this? And then he, the student, um, one of the very few digital humanities students that we actually get to, got interested in programming, um, also created this, this graph and you can, you can scroll through it, you can search through it. Um, and you sort of see a cluster there with history, and if you go further, you see the different, the different nodes connect to that individual um, individually to you know sort of sub types of that, and that's just the start of what you could do. And it's not perfect. There's a link there to sausages, which we don't know why that is there ex exactly, um, but but it's something you can do, and it's a different way of looking at your data. We think. Um, so what we're currently doing is we've got one of our PhD students working on creating a better entity linker. So one of the things about DBpedia and Wikipedia is that it's very much focused on the entertainment domain and also the way it internally works is that um, entities that are popular in the news, so are Barack Obama's or, or um, uh, Ford Motor Companies, uh, the people we actually already know about they usually come up first because of the way they, they program the algorithm, which for a lot of things is handy, but maybe not for us. Um, and one of the things we are working on, and this is going to be presented uh, next month at the Natural Language uh, NLP and DBpedia workshop, is uh, how can we find out more about entities that are not in the database? So, uh, you know, you can't have everything in the database, but we still want to know, for example, if we find something, uh, what is it? So w we're working on entity typing, also trying to find out more about these things. Um, so if you've got like, you know, uh, a new professor or a new president is chosen, is elected somewhere tomorrow, he's not yet in the database, but we can compare the texts that talk about him, the context to other texts and other contexts that talk about presidents then we can probably infer that this person is probably also a president rather than, um, I don't know, a location. So those are things we're trying to do there to overcome the fact that no database is ever going to be uh, complete. Um, from words to concepts, so what, what we also try to do is, is linking terms to synonyms and then we get a sort of a higher level of abstraction and what we use there is uh, Western disintegration, so are we talking about uh, Bank Riverbank or Bank Financial Institution? Um, or are we talking about uh, firing, so dismissing someone or firing uh, using a gun? And uh, we use all sorts of resources like WordNet. Uh, we've got a multilingual central repository, so we can actually link all the Euro WordNets together um, and FrameNet and ProBank, because the FrameNet and ProBank are in English but because we've, we've got them linked to our, uh, our uh, multilingual MCR, uh, we can actually access those as well for non-English um, <coughs> non things. And what that looks like in our file is you've got a word, gebonden, is bound. And we just go to these resources and we try to figure out, well, what, what is it here? So we get ODVN, which is the Dutch WordNet, Open Dutch WordNet. Anyone can use it. Um, open Dutch WordNet, or WordNet, the Dutch WordNet didn't used to be open because there was content in there from Vandalen, but we managed to take that out of there, which is an interesting project, and now it's open. And uh, then we've got all these other sources that were connected as well. And uh, what that allows you to do is allows you to query for event types or action types rather than the words. So give me all the lawsuits in the data set. So you don't have to think about, well, sue and um, what are other words for lawsuits? You don't have to use all the synonyms yourself. And um, 
that helps you to do query expansion. So it takes away some of the work you need to do. Um, and uh, we've already taken some steps in the context of Claria to convert several diachronous lexicons to linked data. And linked data is the semantic web sort of concept of everyone uses the same sort of format and then you can easily <coughs> integrate, th integrate different resources and tag interesting concepts in text. So how that works, um, one of the diachronous lexicons we have is Brauers and that lists a whole bunch of synonyms and also um, when these words were used and in what region. So that's very interesting information to humanities researchers. Um, and that, for example, lists the word Heikeuter or uh, in the source and we find that in a text. And we're actually building a tagger now that can recognize these types of, types of things in a text. Um, we don't quite know what that is. You know, Browse doesn't really give you definitions and those sort of things. Um, we have another resource that's called HISCO, it's the Historical Occupations Database. And that actually gives us a whole hierarchy of occupations. It doesn't list Heikeuter, but it does list Keuterboer. <coughs> and Keuterboer is a synonym of Heikeuter from Browers. So because we've made this link and we've integrated these data sources, we can now say, oh, in this text, Heikeuter's meant, well, that's a Keuterboer, that means a small farmer, because we get that information from the other resource. And we think that that mi might help in um, search, in making things accessible. Go, I mean, you need these resources, but I think a lot of this is out there. And uh, in the Netherlands, Maidens is actually doing a lot of the digitization of these sources. So a lot of them might be old books and stuff, but you know, maybe, maybe it's something interesting for other languages as well. And then what we do in Claria <laughs> is... Um, We've got another work package. So, so the work package for, so the people there are, are interested in all these databases from the International Institute for Social History. And they have, for example, lots of census data. So for them, the, the historical occupations are very, very interesting. And then we've got also to text in which these occupations may be mentioned, but it's not as nicely structured. And uh, then we've got another uh, work package, another pillar in the project that does multimedia. So they've got all the resources from the National Audiovisual Archives and they might have videos or photos that have the same occupations that mention this and then we can actually also link across different types of collections with these things. I have to speed up a little bit. Um, semantic role labeling may be quite familiar so really um, going beyond the syntax, the syntactic analysis, but really who's doing what in a sentence. Um, this is sort of going back to the example that I showed a little bit before. This is a kind of representation that we get of an event in our, um, in our system. So there is an event, it's buy sell. And the buyer is the Porsche family and the seller is Qatar holding in this case. There's some goods transferred, so there's a 10% stake being transferred, there's a timestamp. They don't mention money in either of these articles, so how much money did, did the Porsche family uh, pay for this? If a new article comes in at a later point in time, we can update this and add this information. And we also keep track of where this information comes from, but I haven't really represented that uh, in full detail in this graph, because then it would be... Pfft, um, you don't want that. <coughs> and that actually allows you to do all sorts of really complex searches. So give me all the lawsuits in which a politician was involved between 1990 and 2000. Because we have these, um, these multi-dimensional event representations and we have information about types of entities and types of events in our data as well that we get from adding all these external resources. And then we go a little bit towards pragmatic analysis um, by also looking into who said what, uh, how certain is the speaker about what he or she says? Is he or she talking about the past or the present or the future? So if you've got a sentence like, 
pro-EU campaigners have hoped that big car makers would also support the Remain campaign. Um, so there's a statement, big car makers support the Remain campaign. It's confirmed by the pro-EU campaigners and they hope so and they are certain that it's the future and it's positive. And this is actually coming from the Financial Times. So they're neutral and they're confirming this as well. They're just stating it like this is there. Um, and we've got a baseline system that uh, tries to detect this. this. This is very much work in progress, but it's, it's one of the other areas that we're moving into with uh, some of our projects um, to really try to get those sort of things out of a text. And then we also try to go beyond these things with storylines. Um, but that's very much work in progress and also very much visualization work in progress. Um, if you're interested in NLP modules, we have a really big, big deliverable. It's 158 pages that describes every module in detail for all the four different pipelines. Um, but you can also scroll through it and just click to the module that you're interested in. Uh, we've got the software is all on the website. Uh, there is a black box set up, we could just download it and just run it as is. Um, and then you can also you just get the individual modules from GitHub. Um, and we also have a package for batch processing. And the Claria developments are on the Claria website. And I think this is good for the discussion, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, good, thanks for that. Um, yes, we'll make sure we take in these, uh, uh, these extra points for the, uh, for the discussion. Um, we've got a question at the back. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to, to comment on what you said on dark entities. Mm -hmm. um, when we developing the event database for a European Social Survey, uh, we discovered that um, non-events, um, events that could not be traced, were somehow more important because we saw, uh, for example, comparing the events that were recorded in the database, that some countries like uh, the Netherlands and France didn't mention in their um, recording that the European Union, and after that, uh, the um, Netherlands and um, France didn't vote for the uh, European Constitution. So um, that might be an indicator of uh, of the meaning of the absence of some events. Also, the uh, some events are not uh, present, are not traced, because uh, there is a selection bias in the newspapers. So um, we should uh, focus very much on the, the silent actors, we say in, in our project for PROMAP, for PRODEST, uh, we, we focus on silent actors, actors that they don't appear uh, and uh, who can um, form this latent potential for protest at some point of time. Just a comment. No, I, I, th I think that's, that's, that's very valuable. Um, so what we, s I mean, what ends up on the front page might not be the, the, the most important thing that's really happening in the world. I think we're seeing it now with the fact that all the headlines are about Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie divorcing. Um, whereas uh, another person was shot by the police in the US yesterday and no one is talking about that. Um, or at least, you know, it's somewhere on page 13 in a very small article. It's, it's something that, that's, I think, very, very hard to do with with NLP stuff because we, we can only uh, we can only analyze what's in the text, but um, I think this is a very very uh, important point for, for for visualizing what we can extract 
um, because what you see now, a lot of projects, a lot of visualizations, um, you know, you can see trend lines, you can see Google Trends and you can see what is hot and, and all those peaks and stuff. And also in the European Media Monitor that was mentioned yesterday, you just see the big stories. But how can we also get the small stories into view that, that may be mentioned once or twice? Um, yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, as you can see, we have similar goals, so it's always interesting to see other research on this topic. So I have maybe a comment more than a, a question. So you have quite a long pipeline, right, of services which basically depend on the previous ones. So we also have frequently used these kinds of pipelines, but the problem that we encounter is basically that if you don't have, for example, one component for one particular language, then you cannot do the things in that language. So that's like a big barrier then. Like, you know, you, you need to have all the components in the pipeline for that particular language. Otherwise, you're basically bound to not do yes. that in that language. And another thing is that basically the error that, that you basically get error propagates yeah, yeah. from one component to the next. And then even though you have each component doing 90% well, if you have end. five components, yeah. then at the end you're basically stuck mm -hmm. at, I don't, I don't know, let's say 30 or 40% accuracy. So did you maybe try to see if you can somehow remove some of the dependency on some of the... Because let's say part of speech tagging, depending on what you want to do, probably for semantic role labeling yeah. you need it, right? But if you, let's say, just want to do the entity linking, you don't need the part of speech tagging. You can do directly this wikification mm -hmm. on, the, on the text itself, so you yeah. don't need to depend on that. So have you been thinking about removing some of the components? Um, so, yeah, well, one thing. So for the different, the different pipelines for the different languages look slightly different. Because, um, for example, for Dutch, we, for English, we have three different modules that do uh, part of speech tagging and then limitation and then uh, parsing. And for Dutch, we just have one that does it all. Um, so the pipelines look slightly different. We did find that um, using the named entity recognizer that we built ourselves works better than the named entity recognizer from DBpedia Spotlight. So we actually did use that dependency and our named entity recognizer does need the part of speech tagger. We do have two PhD students in our group <coughs> dedicated to trying to get rid of that pipeline idea and we have actually done research on error propagation and how bad it actually is and it is a problem, um, but uh, the problem is if you delay all your decisions until the end, for example, so keeping all the possible part of speech tags, well, for English, every verb is also a noun, um, and this just explodes. Um, you need to do some really, really smart stuff or do some really, really high performance computing. So we've, we've actually, we, we've got two PhD students working on this, and they're probably not going to solve it, but maybe get a little step further and go away from this from this pipeline idea. So it's, it's definitely on our radar. And also, um, uh, you don't always need the full pipeline, right? So now we, we're talking to different parties for different use cases, and they may just be interested in everything up to opinion and opinion mining. So we just, we can swap out half the other steps that are in there. <coughs>